thank you so much. I appreciate you all joining my session and possibly missing out on keynotes and good seats at the keynote, so thank you. Um, my name is Tim Miller. I'm the technical marketing engineer for Panoptica, which is an interesting new product that uh, we're coming to market with from a different part of Cisco than you might be used to. Uh, I'm in a group called Emerging Technologies in Incubation, and this is a group charged with doing new and different things. Uh, our R&D part of the organization will look at emerging technologies such as Web3, um, back in the day that was blockchain as well, um, and, and that, those sorts of cutting edge technologies are just coming to the industry and evaluating them and seeing what problems customers are having and trying to devise solutions to it like we've done with Panoptica. So how that relates to Panoptica is uh, the cloud native application space, right? Th that is a different beast altogether than our tr traditional applications. Um, so this is a lightning talk, and I'd love to tell you everything there is about Panoptica, but that's not possible in 20 minutes. So since we're in the DevNet zone, we're going to focus on those things that developers would see with Panoptica. So things specific to like the CI CD pipeline and that sort of thing. Um, good news is I have the broader general breakout session tomorrow afternoon at 3.30. So if you want to see the rest of Panoptica and hear the complete picture, um, please join me then. It's uh, D201. All right. Now, cloud native applications are a different beast, as I mentioned. How many folks are in that journey right now, deploying applications in the cloud, doing DevOps? All right. So I'll try and be very brief about that intro then, um, just so that we're not uh, belaboring the point. But then we're going to talk about how developers would leverage Panoptica to work on their container and Kubernetes security and also how we can help you with API security and what that means in, in the context of developers. All right. So I'll, since we're somewhat familiar with cloud native applications, I won't go through this in too much detail, but the heart of cloud native applications is that they're not one single monolithic app anymore. They're broken up into smaller components that are fairly independent called microservices. And so what we might traditionally have deployed as a three-tier app with a web front end, you know, an application server, and a database server now could look very much like this, where the front end is its own, own separate entity, the telemetry related to the app, like logs, click metrics, and things like that are running in a different service. And then how we do billing is yet another independent microservice. And as you can see here, each service is going to need its own you know, source of data so that you can have multiple different types of databases running for the same app, as opposed to that one single monolithic database. But at the end of the day, they all have to merge that data together and present it to the user. So there's a lot of communication that goes on in between them. right? So each microservice is going to be talking to several other microservices and using different protocols. They're not contained to HTTP or you know, even TCP for that matter. We can be sending communications via GRC, GRPC or UDP. So we've got a lot of different communication styles going on. We've got a lot of different components moving around. And so from a security perspective, we no longer have a single front door protected by a nice, pretty firewall that just protects everything. Now we've got all these different endpoints and all these different communication patterns that have to be protected. Um, the other little bitty challenge, very small one, is that it's running on Kubernetes. And so now we've got this other layer of abstraction that is the Kubernetes platform that has its own set of security concerns that we have to be concerned about. And the fun component of this is, is we're, we, as a developer of cloud native applications, we don't own all the code or even the services that we're running to deliver our app to our customers, right? We frequently call out to third-party services. The, the classic example is a payment processing service, right? If I want to process credit cards, I'm going to leverage PayPal or MasterCard and simply pass that 
credit card information off to them, let them deal with all the various data security issues that go with it, and then just get back a transaction ID. So how do I secure something that I don't even own, right? That's a big challenge. How do I assess whether it is secure? And then on top of that, in addition to the traditional browser-based access talking to my front end, I now have a billion or so smart devices wanting to talk to my service. And that front end now is really the app on your phone, and that app needs to talk to all the individual components that are in my data center, whether that's you know, public cloud or private. So massive attack surface. We've just exploded it with 10 to hundreds of these microservices, and we decided to throw a couple billion devices at it at the same time. So that's the challenge. You know, that's the cloud native application security challenge in a nutshell. Um, we start with the easy part with securing the container. All right, so from a container perspective, how I build that container that runs that microservice is defined in the Docker file on the right. And then each individual command builds up a layer. And finally, I have settings, right? So inside each one of these layers, I'm doing software installation. The, the driver for doing containers is to have an easy way to deliver just that app with only its dependencies in it. And so I'm going to have a base image, and then I'm going to install those just those components. And the challenge is, is this is a Python command, if you're not familiar with Python. I'm installing three packages here, wheel, uvicorn, and fast API. But the reality is, is I get over 30 packages from Python because I not only get the packages I need, but all of the dependencies that go with it. Very convenient for a developer, but how do I know what's secure? Because with cloud native applications, by and large, we're using a great deal of open source software. We don't write that software either. We're just leveraging what's already been developed in the community. So we have to know how, what's vulnerable, what's not, and then we, of course, have to secure it. So with that, when we take all those layers together, um, compact, uh, compact that into a comprehensive list, that becomes this software bill of materials. That's the title of the slide. And these SBOMs can then be analyzed for the CVE vulnerabilities. When you call out with Panoptica as part of your CI CD pipeline, the developer will see that comprehensive list of evaluations. In the top red box, we'll give you the package name, Oh, sorry, advanced too far. We'll give you the package name, the, vulner the version that's vulnerable, and if there's a fix available, what those fixes are, right? And so that that's, uh, developer will get instant feedback of what is, what is compromised in their code before they even push it to production. When we build these Docker images, there's also a standard for how you build the container image. So there, uh, it's called the CIS Docker Benchmark. We run that against the container and provide feedback to the developer of best practices related to their container image. All right. And then as a security engineer, we can work with the developers to ensure a minimum standard gets put, uh, uh, that must be met with in order to push this to production. Right, so in Panoptica, and this is a screenshot from Panoptica, I can define the minimum vulnerability level that is allowed, and once, uh, once we exceed that, we can block that. And so in their pipeline, what they'll see is that output, and then the pipeline fails. If they meet that minimum standard, then the pipeline continues. And we do this in the developer's environment and in the developer's ecosystem so that it's a fast fail. It's a common term that you hear with uh, DevOps and cloud native application development so that that feedback is instantaneous right when they're writing that code and, and developing that code so that it's fresh in their mind. They're very efficient at quickly fixing it. And now we don't have easy security f issues to remediate, make it to production, and then become a costly mistake at the end. All right. On the Kubernetes side, I'm just going to skip through this just because I want to be cognizant of the time. But when we get to Kubernetes, we now have to take that container image and build parameters on how to run that container, right? 
Some of these are settings that are specific to Kubernetes, such as how to test that that container's still alive. But then there are a host of settings related to the security. These are settings that, as you know, in the traditional application world, we, we are familiar with, right? We don't run web servers as root, right? As soon as they get compromised, they have access to everything. Analogous concepts apply to Kubernetes, where I can set it up to run as root, I can determine whether or not that uh, container runs as, priv as a uh, privileged container, that's the option down here, I'm just going to point to it. Do I allow this container to escalate its own privileges? It's a novel concept. It's um, you know, equivalent to being al uh, allowing an a, a binary to do SUID, for example. And then from a security perspective, containers are supposed to be immutable. We're not supposed to be able to modify them after they're made. So have we set it up to be read-only? So that if my container does get compromised, somebody can't come in and put, say, a Bitcoin miner on it and then steal my compute cycles. So all of these are settings that can be checked. All of these can be uh, leveraged in, um, in the pipeline. All of these have, like I mentioned Docker benchmarks before, all of these have best practices that we can check to ensure that your application is deployed properly and in the best uh, securely, secure posture. So from the deployment side, here we go. Right? I have policies in Panoptica that will allow me to go through these settings, and here's a screenshot of that last slide here. I can look at those settings and do minimum standards so that when the pipeline brings me something to deploy, I can then check, call out to Panoptica, check it for these minimum standards, such as the permissions, the security context, and more importantly, I can inspect the YAML for that application and see if there are any secrets in sto stored in it that can be claimed, right? So I'm, I'm actually scanning this for secret leakage and making sure that we're not pushing into our production environment any secrets that can be uh, leaked out. And so at the end of the day, I still have to have those secrets, right? When I make a call from one API to another, there has to be authentication. There has to be a way to identify these services to each other. And with Panoptica, we can do token injection. So we, we run on your behalf, open source vault. So we have, you know, we're basically deploying HashiCorp vault behind the scenes inside of Panoptica. You can store the secrets in that. And then using rules, in this case, the token injection rule, we can inject those tokens when that workload spins up. And so if you peel back the layers and look inside a Panoptica, or look inside that application when it's running, you'll see the vault variables automatically injected and the reference to vault to extract them. So in your workload, your secrets are not visible in any sort of way. Yep. All right. That's container and runtime security in a nutshell. On the API side, I'll advance this out just a little bit just to talk about it. When we talk about API security, there's the traditional sorts of security that come into play uh, if you're familiar with firewalls and transport security, right? Can a source talk to a destination? In a traditional world, that's source IP, destination IP, and so forth. We can certainly do that, and again, tomorrow at my breakout session, we'll talk about that in more detail. Uh, but in this session, I'm going to focus on the API side of this. So we're going to talk about endpoints. Right. When, I, when I publish a service, and so this is kind of a blow up of a, that sample application where my front end is talking to the booking service, and in that booking service, I might have reservation capability, right? So and the top endpoint here, this get reservation, would be an example of how I get a specific reservation, right? I'm going to pick on the, uh, the scanner, uh, the young lady who's doing the scanning. You know, I could get Liz's specific reservations out of this, right? The bottom example would be one of creating a reservation. So making this call, I would make a reservation for myself. So when 
when I have these types of endpoints, there's certain key components that are important. One is that authentication aspect. One is what data is expected from that endpoint in the get, so I have to know what parameters come back with a reservation. And then when I make one, I also have to have a well-defined standard of what I'm sending, right? All of those things go into an open API spec, or specification, right? It used to be called Swagger if you've been around long enough. And we can look at that open API specification, look at those definitions and analyze them. Oh, oh, I forgot to mention that in addition to authentication, there's an authorization component as well. So when we're securing these APIs, we have that token concept, but we also have a couple of unique concepts uh, for open APIs that um, come into play. And these come from the OWASP API security top 10. So OWASP is an organization that produces all sorts of top 10 lists for security. Again, industry best practices. One is the broken object level authorization, in which I'm basically, instead of knowing a specific ID because I've gotten a list of reservations and now I want specific details of one of those, I'm randomly guessing IDs to see what I can find, right? And so this would be a tactic uh, a bad actor would use to try and exploit the system. And if that tactic works, that is something called broken object level authorization or BOLA. In a similar regard, we have something called broken function level authorization where I know this particular endpoint exists but I'm guessing that this one exists. So I'm going to try and guess at what endpoints exist in the system and try and expose information from there. And if you're relying on the classic security by obscurity approach, bad actors can find these, they're easy to guess. And if you're not securing them properly, then you have something called BFLA. All right. Now an example of this, looking at that spec, doing that spec analysis, I can see that uh, in this particular case, the developer said that I was going to send back an array or expect an array, this is bi-directional, but I didn't say how long that array could be, right? And this is a classic example of a buffer overrun. If I don't say I'm expecting a size of 15, then I have to expect an infinite size, otherwise my code won't be set up properly to expect up to 15. And so we'd, that is easily seen in the spec, the open API spec. And so our analyzer, as part of the pipeline, will look at that open API spec and provide that feedback in the pipeline. And then, of course, in, in the interface, uh, security engineers, as well as the developers, if you give them access to the portal, uh, will see these types of reports. And that's where you find it. All right, I actually pointed to it without clicking through it. All right, it's a lightning talk. Again, this was all very specific to the developer perspective. So these are the types of things that the developer will integrate into their pipeline and the types of security that they can implement them you know, in conjunction with the security team. They can implement and help secure the overall application in the pipeline. This is a summary of the features. The ones in black are the ones we actually talked about. There's a couple other ones as well that we didn't get to um, that allow us, and, and I did mention a little bit about the pod security standards, but these are things that are uh, possible for the developer to help secure your applications without them doing anything extra other than use their normal pipelines. And so that's one of the big things about developer, uh, or excuse me, about cloud native application security is shifting this security further to the developer to the left, remediating it before that code actually makes it into production. And our goal is to do this in a frictionless way. All right. Again, last plug. My breakout session is tomorrow. You'll get the full picture of, of Panoptica. Uh, we do have a sister product uh, that is uh, the Istio Service Mesh, Callisti. You can learn more about it. Um, for those that joined late, the slides are in the WebEx space. So if you, in your Cisco Live app, you join the, the WebEx space for this session, you'll get these slides and these links are available. Um, I have a couple colleagues that are presenting related sessions. 
Uh, Ed is doing a DevNet workshop just on the other side of the wall, uh, and you'll actually get to uh, do a workshop specific to Panoptica using a real cluster and using the interface. So that'll be a fun hands-on session. That one's Thursday at three. And then my distinguished colleague is talking about data security that we're looking at bringing into Panoptica. So that will be a very interesting story uh, to, to pay attention to. And with that, uh, if you want to learn more about our group, Emerging Technologies and Incubation, th the different way we're approaching this, um, my manager, uh, Tim Segetti is giving an eye talk at the end of the week on Thursday at 11. Um, and I don't have a, sl a slide for this, but I will point out the different way we're doing things. If you want to try Panoptica, you can go to panoptica.app right now. There is a free tier license. Basically, you sign up, that's your license. You get to have access to all the features, up to one cluster and 10 nodes. And so that we are approaching this like other cloud native uh, solutions out there so that you don't have to talk to me again if you don't want to. I'd love to, don't get me wrong. But you can go out, try it yourself, deploy it on your cluster today and see uh, the types of securities that you learned about here in the lightning talk as well as my session tomorrow. And with that, please complete your surveys. You're going to hear all of us this week talk about surveys and how important they are. Um, you do get a prize for filling out surveys, but more importantly, uh, I'd love to hear what you thought of the session, and more importantly, I'd love to hear what you thought of it and uh, how I delivered it so that I can improve myself. And with that, again, thank you so much for joining the session. Um, hope you have a great conference. This is the basically kicking it off, so thank you again for joining me for the first day. All right. Any, any questions? No? So the question was, who came up with the name? It's, it's a funny story. Um, this is probably the fourth name of the product, <laughs> uh, but it is the last one. Um, it, it, we, went, we went live with this product last summer at Cisco Live US. Um, it was... Um, uh, the VP for our group. And so it, the previous name was Secure Application Cloud. And since we're really trying to target the cloud native space, if you look at the cloud native landscape, they all have cool names. Secure Application Cloud, let's be candid, isn't very cool. So, um, so Panoptica is, is this term that uh, it's actually, I forget which civilization it was, but uh, I th possibly, but it, it, it refers to um, uh, the vantage point for a bunch of you know, rooms. And so there's a central vantage point that had full access to all the rooms that went behind it. So, so I, yeah, our VP, I think, of, of product management came up with that. So. Yeah, much cooler than Secure App Cloud. <laughs> all right.